Hello everyone, it's good to be back again today. Uh, today's Thursday and it's the uh, continuing series uh, that we've been doing uh, from an educational perspective on different topics, various topics. My name is Salvatore Di Costanzo. I'm an elder law and estate planning attorney. Uh, I'd like to start out as I always do to thank all of our essential workers out there, our doctors, our nurses. Uh, can't name everybody because I just uh, I simply, I, I, I'm not smart enough to name everybody. Uh, I saw something on TV today that actually listed out uh, in a scroll-like fashion all the different uh, occupations and professions that have helped us through this crisis. So I just want to thank everybody for what they've done for our family members and for the community and, uh, and what they'll continue to be doing as, uh, as time goes on. So today uh, I thought we'd talk about something that, that comes up very often uh, regarding uh, transferring your house. Uh, people often are very concerned about trying to uh, protect their house if they get sick, uh, if they need home care, if they need nursing home care. And there are a few different ways from a legal perspective that you can gift your house or that you can plan for, for your house or that you can protect your house. And uh, some of these mechanisms are not really the best options for you. And you've got to be careful because if you go to an attorney uh, and, and they offer you a planning technique for your house that isn't the most optimal planning technique, you could, you could be, you know, planning to fail, if you would. Uh, and generally speaking, and also from a tax perspective. So I'm an accountant as well as an elder law estate planning attorney, and I'm able to talk to you about the tax consequences of, of transferring assets and, it, and it's very important and so the, the conversation usually comes up when somebody goes to their their attorney and says listen uh, I really I really want to get the house out of my name you know perhaps there are children and I want to get the house out of my name and uh, I want to make sure that if I get sick uh, it doesn't go to a nursing home uh, or it doesn't have to be sold or a lien doesn't have to be placed against it and at a very basic level, uh, the first option that I'm going to speak about, and there's, there's largely three options, but the first one is to just transfer the house out of your name to your kids. There are a lot of attorneys out there that tell their clients, okay, let's get the house out of your name. I'll prepare a deed. We'll transfer the house to your kids. You're done, right? Let's analyze that. From a Medicaid perspective, when you transfer your house, if we're talking about planning for nursing home care, there's a five-year look-back period. So if you take your house today, if you do a deed and you give it to your kids, there's a five-year look-back period. So if you need nursing home care within the five-year period after you do that, you're going to be ineligible for Medicaid, right? And we're not going to talk about all the different Medicaid eligibility rules today, but there are things that we would need to do to reverse that transaction to render you eligible for Medicaid. So you've got the five-year look-back period, right? From a tax perspective, you, there's something called basis. So when you buy your house, let's say you spent $300,000 on your house. That's your basis. You paid $300,000 for your house. You put $50,000 of improvements into your house. Now your basis is $350,000. So your basis in your house is the initial purchase price plus improvements, and you get to your basis. Let's say you sell your house for $600,000. The gain is the difference between the 600,000 and your basis, right? So in the example that I just used, it's a $250,000 gain. And then there's all different rules as to whether you can exclude that gain and the taxes that you might have to pay or not. When you take a piece of real property, like your house, and you just transfer it to your kids outright, your basis in that property is going to become their basis in that property. And that's not a good thing. 
Because when they go to sell it someday, that basis is probably very low. A lot of my clients, the basis in the property is largely insignificant. They may have built a house or they purchased a house in the 70s. So when those kids go to sell that house someday, probably after you die, they're going to have a really big capital gain. It's going to be the fair market value less the cost basis. And they're going to have to pay taxes on that. There are no exclusions. It's probably not their primary residence. They probably don't live there. So there's going to be a big tax burden if you just take your house and move it to your kids. So we don't want you to do that. The other problems that you run into are that when you're not an owner of the house anymore, if you just take the house and give it to your kids, you should lose your star exemption, right? You may get an enhanced star exemption. All that's going to be lost because you're not the owner of the property anymore. And to the extent you can deduct real estate taxes, uh, you won't be able to. You're not the owner. So when somebody tells you to just take your house and transfer it to your kids, which this happens all the time. I've seen it happen a million times. It's, not, it's, it's the least favorable technique. Because generally speaking, you're going to run into tax consequences for the kids, tax consequences for you, and there are Medicaid implications, which there are Medicaid implications with pretty much any option that you choose, but this one is a little bit more serious from a tax perspective. The second option that we would see people do on a very regular basis, which has sort of become outdated, is the life estate deed. Now, many people have heard of the life estate deed. A life estate deed is where you take your house, you transfer it to your kids, but you retain the right to live there for the rest of your life. That's the life estate. Let's talk about that from a Medicaid and from a tax perspective. From a Medicaid perspective, again, we have the five-year look-back period. When you transfer the house to the kids, there's a five-year look-back period, right? you're actually transferring what we call a remainder interest, the right that the kids have to inherit the house upon your death. From a tax perspective, it's better than the outright transfer. Here's why. There's no carryover basis. So that example that I just gave you, where you transfer your property to the kids and the kids take the carryover basis, that doesn't happen with the life estate. When you retain the life estate, that's called a retained interest. And when you die, you get a step up in basis for the property. So what does that mean? Let's say the property is worth $600,000 on your debt. Same example that I was using before. When you die, because of that retained interest, because of that right to live in the house for the rest of your life, the basis gets stepped up to fair market value. So the basis was $350,000 in my example. When you die, the kids inherit the house because they own the remainder, and the basis goes from three fifty dollars all the way up to six hundred, dollars automatically. So that way, when they go to sell the house, there's zero capital gain. $600,000 is the sales price. $600,000 is the cost basis. So there's no capital gain. So you might say, Sal, that sounds great. Why isn't everybody doing that? Well, everybody was doing that years ago. You see, prior to 2005, the look-back period for those types of transactions was only three years. After 2005, the look-back period changed to five years for all transactions. And in a moment, I'm going to talk to you about the Medicaid trust, which you've heard me talk about in the past, which happens to be the most optimal planning technique. But back then, people would have to decide, should I do a life estate or should I do a Medicaid trust? And most people would opt for the life estate because of the three-year look-back period. They would say, you know... I'm a little nervous about the five-year look-back period, which that was the look-back period for the trust at that point in time. 
And I'm a little nervous to take on a five-year look-back period. So let's do the life estate. It's only three years. And the life estate was also cheaper from a legal fee perspective. We would charge less money for that. But there are some in inherent flaws with a life estate deed. right? And I'll get into those in a minute. But some of the other attributes of a life estate that are beneficial, in addition to the step-up in basis, is that you still get the, the, the star exemption. See, as the life tenant, you're treated as the owner of the property. So you still get the star exemption or the enhanced star exemption. If you have any veterans benefits, you still get all of that. You're responsible for the upkeep and maintenance on the house. You're responsible to pay for the taxes. You're the owner of the property. So you get to deduct your taxes on your tax return. Now, the tax law changed a couple of years ago, limiting the state and local tax deduction in New York State. But for New York purposes, for New York State tax return purposes, it's not limited. And uh, when people were drafting life estates, uh, you know, years ago, with more frequency, the tax laws were a little bit different. So the life estate transaction gives you certain benefits that an outright transfer doesn't give you, but it actually falls short of some of the benefits that a Medicaid trust will give you. But it's not the worst case scenario. A lot of clients that come in here today that have done life estate deeds, I tell them to leave it alone because they probably already got past the five year look back period and we don't want to really upset the apple cart and try to do it all over again. One of the downsides of a life estate deed is largely attributable to selling the property. So if you did a life estate deed, a lot of clients would walk into my office prior to 2005 and say, I'm never going into a nursing home, right? I'm never selling my house. I'm going to die here. They're going to take me out on a stretcher. You know, and I would argue a little bit, but at the end of the day, it was very difficult to argue with somebody that doesn't ever think that they're going to die. Uh, you know, I would say to the client, listen, uh, when you have the magic formula, please share it with me. I'd like to know how to stay out of a nursing home. And I'd like to know that you're absolutely never going to sell your house, etc. So people would do the life estate deed, right? But here's the problem with a life estate deed. If you sell that house while you're alive, then a portion of the money or a portion of the sales proceeds goes back to you as the life tenant. And a portion of the proceeds goes to your kids as the remainder beneficiaries. And then you've got to calculate the gain, the tax effect on that. So you as the owner of the property, a portion of the gain might be allocated to you. And you don't have to pay any taxes because there are tax laws that say if it's your primary residence, you could exclude a certain amount of gain. So you're, you're probably free and clear. But the kids own a little piece of the house as the remainder beneficiaries from a tax perspective. Not, not, a, not a star exemption perspective, not a veteran's benefit perspective, not a real estate tax perspective. I'm talking about income tax purposes now. They own a piece of the property. So they now have to calculate a percentage of the gain. And to the surprise of many families, there's a tax that needs to be paid because the kids are not allowed to exclude any of that gain. And that's a really big problem with life estates. It's one of the main reasons why we don't want to do a life estate. We want to do a Medicaid trust. And so when does this happen? It happens when you sell the house. And when do you have to sell the house? Well, sometimes the house has to be sold Let's say you go into a nursing, a nursing home, right? And the house is an exempt asset. So maybe you get, uh, you know, Medicaid, right? And the kids can't afford to pay the upkeep and maintenance on the house. They know they're going to inherit it someday, but they're on fixed incomes or whatever the case may be. And they say, listen, this house is a burden. We've got to sell it. Now you sell it and it's sold during your lifetime while you're in a nursing home. And some of that money now comes back to you. But you're on Medicaid, you're going to lose that money because you're in a nursing home, right? So selling the house that's subject to the life estate transaction is not a good idea 
You want to sell it after you die. You want your kids to inherit it with a stepped up basis and pay no taxes. But that's not always possible. That's not always the case. That's the life estate transaction. The final option is the Medicaid trust. And the Medicaid trust gives you all the flexibility in the world and it protects you from a tax perspective and a Medicaid perspective. Let's talk about that in general terms. When you set up a Medicaid trust, it's a piece of paper, just like your will or any other document, and you transfer the house to the trust the children might be the trustees of the trust. And you have the right to live there for the rest of your life. Now, the way the trust is drafted, just like a life estate, you have the right to live there. And so, therefore, when you die, there's a step up in basis. Right? There's a five-year look-back period for Medicaid purposes when you transfer the house. So we still have that five-year look-back period. And I was saying before that it used to be that the life estate had a three-year look-back period, but when they changed that to a five-year look-back period, because the Medicaid trust has gotten more benefits, the life estate became, you know, it's not an optimal planning technique. People started moving more towards the Medicaid trust. The benefit of the Medicaid trust from a tax perspective is the property could be sold at any time inside the trust. And none of that money goes back to you. It stays in the trust. And it doesn't go to the kids. It stays in the trust. And if there's any gain, if there's any capital gain from the sale of the house, it's completely, 100% allocable back to you. You don't have that piece having to be allocated to the kids, like a life estate does. So if we transfer the house into a trust, five years goes by, we're free and clear from a Medicaid perspective. Now from a tax perspective, for whatever reason, we decide that this house, it's a very easy transaction. And if there's any gain, let's say the house is sold for 600,000 and the cost basis is 350, that's a $250,000 capital gain. You as the creator of the trust, and the owner of the trust from a tax perspective, you can exclude all of that gain. You don't have to pay any taxes. So the Medicaid trust is an optimal planning technique from a Medicaid perspective and a tax perspective. And that's clearly one of the things that we're drafting we're on a regular basis these days because the other two options just are not sufficient. So, and, you know, the final piece, which the life estate and the Medicaid trust both do, is avoids probate, which is a good thing. That saves a lot of money uh, in, in legal fees. So if you're somebody that has a life estate, I wouldn't worry. But you want to be cautious about not selling, if you, if you can control it, not selling the property prior to death. If you've done no planning up to this point with your house then what you want to do is seriously consider the Medicaid trust. The last thing I want you to do is transfer your house to your kids outright. The only time we really see that happening is when, let's say you purchased a house and uh, it's a recent purchase. You purchased it, let's say, for $600,000. And your basis is $600,000, obviously. When you transfer the house to the kids so soon after a recent purchase, there's really no discrepancy, right, in the purchase price and the fair market value. So we're not so concerned about the tax issues. And there are some things that we can do in the deed to still get you the, the life estate, uh, I mean the star exemption or the veterans exemptions, but it's not, it's not the optimal planning technique. The Medicaid trust is really the optimal planning technique. So as you can see, there are tax consequences associated with all of these transfer techniques. There are three techniques that we seem to see on a regular basis. They're all being implemented uh, by attorneys in this world. 
one is better than the other, there's clearly one that is more optimal than the other two, and, there's, and one is clearly the least optimal of, of all three options. So you should really take the time to meet with somebody who is proficient in tax matters as well as elbow on estate planning matters. I am that person. I am proficient in tax matters and legal matters. And I'll be happy to explain to you all of the different options that we can implement regarding your real property. So that way, ultimately, we might be able to protect that asset. So that way, if you ever need nursing home care someday, or home care, whatever the case may be, we can avoid having to sell that house or a lien being placed against the house and losing the equity value in that house to the cost of your long-term care. So with that being said, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, but I don't think there are. You're free to send me questions after hearing this. It's a little bit more of a complicated topic than what we've been talking about in the past. Uh, so I did my best to try to keep it as simple as possible. And uh, if you like these seminars, I'd like for you to share them with your friends. Uh, I'd like for you to visit my website, which is planned today for tomorrow. You can reach me by email, which is smd at mfd-law.com. And we're, we're going to continue these each and every week. Uh, and uh, if there's anything else, feel free to reach out to me. And I also wanted to remind everybody that tomorrow at 10 o'clock uh, a.m., I'm going to be lecturing for the Yorktown Chamber of Commerce on some of the topics that I've already done on these Thursday remote planning sessions. Uh, we're going to be talking about just your typical estate plan, the documents that you need, how we can get them signed during this crisis. And if there's anybody that might find that interesting, please feel free to join. Otherwise, stay well and stay healthy, and I look forward to speaking to you again. Take care.